All right, let's start with a sound check. Can you hear me in the back row? Can you hear me in the back row? Excellent. Um, today we're going to start talking about the only pathway that we'll be talking about this semester that's unique to plants. Uh, but since it keeps us alive, it, it's really worthwhile. And it won't be a whole lot more than what you know already because it's going to borrow heavily from things you've already learned about oxidative phosphorylation and about things like uh, gluconeogenesis and the pentose phosphate pathway. So photosynthesis shouldn't be too wildly strange. There are obviously some very strange bits to it, but many parts of it um, are going to be intelligible, especially compared to what's gone before. <coughs> Just to sort of refresh the context, uh, photosynthesis is going to be the series, the connection of metabolic processes that can capture light energy to turn CO2 into small carbon intermediates and ultimately into monosaccharides. Um, so we're here sort of at the heart of the metabolism and it's an anabolic process. We're building up sugars that didn't exist before. And this is just a nice little mess of uh, green and, and uh, blue-green algae uh, that are very busily photosynthesizing and making oxygen so we can all keep on breathing. When we talk about photosynthesis, we divide it, broadly speaking, into two groups of reactions or processes. We talk about the light reactions, which can only happen in the light. And we talk about the dark reactions that can happen in the dark, although in many plants they're also happening during the light. The light reactions are going to capture energy from photons and use that energy from photons to make high energy electrons. Then we're going to see electron flow move protons in a way very similar to the way electron flow moved protons in the mitochondria. Those protons build up as a gradient, and the proton gradient will drive ATP synthesis, a lot like the mitochondria. Um, the electrons that we've ripped out of water are going to be used to reduce NADP to NADPH, so we know that that's a good uh, resource for uh, anabolism, for building things up, and it's going to release oxygen. In the dark reactions, we take the products of the light reactions, which is ATP and ADPH, and use that to both capture, as we say, fix carbon dioxide, and to reduce that carbon dioxide to a more reduced form so we can have sugar. And that's what we're going to be doing um, in, in detail as, over the next couple of hours. <coughs> so let me give you a little bit of a Cook's tour of a mitochondrion, I mean a chloroplast. They're both double membrane bound. Anyhow, it has an outer membrane like mitochondria. It has an inner membrane like mitochondria. The stuff in the middle is called stroma, and, and, and I'll make a comparison in a little bit. And it has these stacks of membranes called phylicoids. And the phylicoids are going to be where the actual action of photosynthesis occurs, uh, of the light reactions. And then those phylicoids have inside them a hollow space called a lumen. And this is an actual picture of a chloroplast. And you can see that there's really quite a lot of organization. I mean, to think of this as an organelle within a cell, it clearly has more organization than many prokaryotes have. Um, these membranes of the phylicoids, in some cases, appear to anchor at the poles of the, of the chloroplast. And you can actually see here a starch grain starting to grow. To help you have um, the equivalences more explicitly, I threw this one in as an extra one. Um, so, ah, uh, yes, let me get my pointer. Uh, arrow options. Okay. Um, uh, so the inner and outer membrane mean the same thing in chloroplasts as in mitochondria. Uh, the stroma is the equivalent of the matrix in the mitochondrion. Um, a phylicoid is, loosely speaking, an equivalent of a crista, of a membrane enfolding in the mitochondrion. And the phylicoid lumen is, topologically speaking, the same as the intermembrane space. And that may not be obvious right away, but it will turn out to be very important. So the intermembrane space is the space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. Or another way to think of it is 
the in, inner membrane, intermembrane space is the stuff that's on the other side from the stroma. And since you get to the thylakoid lumen by going from the stroma into it, topologically speaking, it is the same as the intermembrane space. It is on the other side from the stroma. Any questions about that before we move on? Okay. And so now we can pick up another new bit of chemistry. We did a lot about oxidation and reduction when we got into the mitochondria. In the chloroplast, we have to introduce yet another kind of chemistry, which is photochemistry. And photochemistry embraces all the things that happen when molecules interact with light. Um, you can think of a photon as a little packet of light energy. Uh, it's only a wave until it does something. And so each photon delivers a certain amount of energy when it hits something. Now, whether anything happens or not is going to depend intimately on what the exact molecular structure is that that photon hits. And so if we look at several of these molecules, these are some of the molecules in the chloroplast or in blue-green algae that can absorb light. Um, and here you have chlorophyll A, and chlorophyll A is obviously the, the pop star who, uh, you know, the, the bono of the uh, photochrome world. Uh, and it's got a magnesium in the center. This is clearly like a heme ring. It's a tetrapearl. Um, it has its little lipid tail. Here's something that looks somewhat similar. You can see it's got these five-membered rings, but they're strung out straight. It's called a linear tetrapearl, phycocyanin. This and related pigments are very abundant in blue-green algae and red algae. And here's beta-carotene, and as you can guess, that's probably orange-colored. Um, and this doesn't have nearly so complicated a structure. It does have this... Um, uh, uh, repeating branch structure. But the common feature to all of them is the number of double bonds. These are all structures in which multiple double bonds, many of them in a aromatic configuration, occur. And that's because that kind of electron cloud turns out to be a really good place for electrons to get captured. And so just by looking at these structures, you can guess that they probably will have some kind of interaction with light. <coughs> So if we look at the uh, visible spectrum, and I'm sorry that we don't have color copiers that we can use on a routine basis, uh, but it's in your book with colors. Um, if we look at what the sun puts out, here is the dark line. This is the solar radiation. This is what the sun puts out. So it emits photons of a very wide range of energies. If you look at the absorptions of the various pigments, they have much narrower absorptions than the sun has output. So for instance, here's chlorophyll A with a peak here, and a second peak over here. Here's chlorophyll B, B with a peak here, and a second peak over there. But if you add them all together, you can see that overall, it's ca where the pigments can capture a fairly large fraction of the light emission. So what happens after that photon is absorbed? What happens when that energy is, is captured into a molecule? Well, several things can happen. Here we have a chlorophyll molecule. And the sun is shining, and it has just absorbed a photon. And we call that molecule now excited. This is a process we call excitation. So the electrons in that molecule are now going to be, uh, they'll, uh, they'll absorb the energy of the photon, and they're going to be themselves now more energetic. What happens, here's the chlorophyll star is a way of saying it's an excited chlorophyll. It's excited. It wants to do something, anything, something. Well, it can do many things. And excited chlorophyll can simply release that energy as heat and go back to ordinary chlorophyll. Uh, the excited chlorophyll can release it as light in a different wavelength. And that makes fluorescence. If you've ever noticed in the fall how the trees look brighter than the sky, they literally are. The pigments in the fall colors can actually re-emit light um, so that they actually are brighter than they would be by reflection alone. Um, another thing that can happen is this excited chlorophyll can touch another molecule and make that molecule excited, sort of a bucket brigade approach to excitement. Now the chlorophyll is relaxed and the new molecule is excited. Or something very happy and exciting can happen. The chlorophyll can, un can undergo 
uh, can be part of a photooxidation event. That is, the excitement in the chlorophyll can allow it to take part in a transfer of electrons. And in that case, it goes, it, the, um, in, as you can see here at the bottom, the chlorophyll is positively charged there. That's because it gave up electrons to make this molecule X a reduced molecule. And so this photooxidation is going to be the core of why photosynthesis works. An excited <coughs> chlorophyll can give up its electron and give it to another target. So it becomes very important for the, photo, for the leaf or for the chloroplast to absorb light as efficiently as possible. And this takes place in things called light harvesting complexes. And these are some pictures of what light harvesting complexes look like. And if you look at them, you can see the ribbon type things that we're familiar with for alpha helices. And then these very sort of chicken wiry things that are multiple molecules of pigments, chlorophylls and other pigments. But I think you can get the general sense that um, the, as a whole, the light harvesting complex is highly organized and has placed those pigments in very specific arrangements relative to each other. And so they allow for very efficient capture and transfer of molecules. Here we're looking, is that a question? Here we're looking down on top of it, and you can see here the, the chlorophylls and the carotenoids there. Here they've uh, cleared away to just the, uh, just the chromophores themselves. Um, and part of what this light harvesting complex allows to happen is that light can be absorbed by any of these chromophores, these, these colored molecules that can absorb light. It can be absorbed by any of them and, and excite that molecule. But it's organized in such a way that that energy can then get transferred to a central, very special molecule called the reaction center. So the light can get absorbed anywhere around here, but for the fancy stuff to happen, it has to be transferred over and over until it hits the reaction center, which will do the next step. Photosynthesis in land plants and in blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, um, has two big components that are involved in this, two things called photosystems. And they have some similarities and they have some differences. We're going to start with talking about photosystem two, which seems backwards. I mean, why would you start talking about photosystem two first? Well, it's called photosystem two, uh, partly because it was discovered second, it turns out to have evolved second, but it is the beginning of the chain of most of the photosynthesis in land plants and in cyanobacteria. So we're going to start here, even though it has a funny name for where it is. And what it's going to be able to do is to be an enzyme that can do a light-driven oxidation reduction. Um, and what's going on here is there are very special the chlorophylls absorb the photons, and they transfer that to reaction centers. And the reaction center in uh, photosystem 2 is called P680, which stands for pigment that absorbs strongly at 680. And P680 has the, the special unique properties that are needed to do the next steps. When the energy gets to the P680, it becomes excited. Here's an excited P680. It's very excited. P680 really wants to give off electrons. It's an extremely good reducing agent. And when it gives off its electron, here's the electron coming off, it now turns into P680+. P680 plus is very hungry for electrons. It wants electrons. And its electrons, which will turn it back into plain old P60, the electrons that are needed to restore P680 or to reduce P680 plus are going to come from water. This, this enzyme system, this photosystem, is able to steal electrons from water. It, it is big enough that it actually looks like a thing. Um, I think that's one of the fun things about studying biochemistry these days is you don't just have a little black box. You actually have pictures of the things that you're looking at. And we know this, this system in a surprising amount of detail. So here is looking at the structure of photosystem 2. Um, in the plane of a membrane, looking at uh, the various alpha helices and the various pigments uh, that are obviously very organized. 
Here we're looking at it a little more schematically. And they're making the point that P, uh, photosystem 2 is, is part of the membrane. It's embedded in the membrane and then sticks out of that. But it's key to the way it's going to do things that it is part of the membrane. It's a huge membrane protein complex. <clears throat> so the P680 is going to be on the side towards the lumen, the inside of that thylakoid. And the electrons that uh, are, are pushed out of P680 by light or that come from P680 um, are going to be transferred, again, sort of a bucket brigade style to other redox groups. Just as in complex one in the mitochondrion, there were several redox reactions inside the big complex. Same kind of thing here in general. Once those electrons make their way from the luminal side down here to the stromal side, um, those electrons will be transferred to plastoquinone. Should sound familiar. We saw ubiquinone in the mitochondrion. Plastoquinone is a re related compound that's present in the cytopla cytoplast, a chloroplast. Um, those electron transfer reactions and so forth are going to use up protons that it gets from the stroma, which would have been the matrix. So what this is going to do overall is move electrons through several redox states and in the process move protons from the, the stroma or the matrix into the lumen, which is similar to the intermembrane space. So we're starting to build up a proton gradient. Questions about that? This is giving you a little bit of a feeling for just how organized all of those pigments have to be. Um, here you can see uh, the, the reaction center, the P680, that's going to be the actual donor of the electrons. And there's a specific sequence that, that passes through, through phaophyton, a uh, plastoquinone that's part of the complex that stays there. Um, iron is going to participate. And then finally transferred to plastoquinone uh, to reduce it. So really, a lot of similarities uh, to what we saw in complex one of electron transport. <clears throat> so how is oxygen involved in all of this? Um, so we started with P680. We excited it with a photon to make P680 star, the excited form of it. Um, it gave off its electron and became P680 plus down here, right? P680 plus is the strongest biological oxidant known. It loves to pull off electrons and is actually going to be able to pull electrons away from oxygen, actually, which is pretty weird. It can oxidize oxygen. Um, so we're going to be seeing uh, the protons here released into the stroma, and the oxygen in the H2O is starting to be oxidized. Similarly, or in parallel, the P680 star is a very strong reducing agent. You see it's way up here on the negative end of the electron motive scale. So P680 plus is down here, P680 star is up there. Um, it turns out that there's a critical tyrosine that's going to be able to be part of the bucket brigade carrying these electrons. It's going to be part of the transfer from the water to the P680 star. So there's um, a transient period of time in which the tyrosine takes this form of being a, an oxygen with an unshared electron. Okay. This is what it looks in a schematic way. <clears throat> absorbing solar energy, absorbing photons, absorbing light is going to drive uh, redox reactions that are going to generate uh, pla reduced plastoquinone. So here you can see the electrons uh, from the photosystem making reduced plastoquinone. It's going to, that sort of, that gaping pit of lost electrons is going to suck electrons from water. And when it sucks the electrons from water, it produces oxygen. So in electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation, the last event was transferring electrons to oxygen and making water. In photosynthesis, we start with water take electrons away and release oxygen. So they're opposite ends of the process. 
and coupled to all of this are proton movements. So the, the protons needed to make the plastic, reduced plastic quinone come from the stroma, and the protons released when you make oxygen stay in the lumen. So the net effect is really quite a big change in the number of protons from one side to the other. Just as complex one, couple the movement of electrons to pumping protons. Questions? So what's going to happen to that reduced plastiquinone? So here's our molecules of reduced plastiquinone. Um, they are going to go to another membrane component. So this is an integral membrane protein comp complex, several proteins in there, called cytochrome B6F. Um, and cytochrome B6F is going to take electrons from the reduced plastiquinone, rather like the way that complex 3 took electrons from reduced ubiquinone. Um, and the electrons that it takes from the plastoquinone, it's going to transfer those electrons to a new, another protein called plastocyanin. And plastocyanin gets its name plasto because it's in the chloroplast, cyanin because it's kind of a bluey green, which it gets from the copper in it. So this is a small protein with a complex around the copper. Um, the, the sort of active center of cytochrome B6F has, again, things like the risky sulfur iron and so on. Their structures are so similar. Look at how they overlap. Gray is one and red is the other of them. So there's clearly a deep, deep relationship between these two systems in how they capture electrons and move them, how they pump protons. <clears throat> Plastocyanin is kind of an analog, if you like, of cytochrome C. It's the water-soluble um, protein that picks up the electrons and is going to carry those electrons to the next complex. And again, we see protons moving. So there are protons picked up to re regenerate the plastoquinone. There are protons given off when the reduced plastoquinone gives up its electrons. And if you do all the bookkeeping on all of this, the reason they're doing multiples over here is because they're doing it for an entire oxygen molecule. So one oxygen molecule means that eight protons are pumped overall in terms of this. <clears throat> so now we're getting to the second of the photosystems. Uh, photosystem one is called that because it was discovered first. It happens coincidentally that it evolved first. So this is a very, very ancient piece of machinery. There are um, purple bacteria and green bacteria that can do photosynthesis but do not make oxygen. All they have is photosystem one. Uh, so it's a very old, old system. It also, like photosystem two, is a light-driven oxidation reduction enzyme, a, a complex of proteins that can absorb light and catalyze electron transfers in oxidation reduction reactions. <clears throat> just like photosystem one, the chlorophylls can absorb pro photons. Uh, just like photosystem one, they can transfer that energy from those antenna pigments into the center to reaction centers. In this case, the critical pigment is called P700. Its absorption peak is a little different than P680, so it's called P700. When P700 gets excited, becomes P700 star, all excited, full of energy, loves to give off electrons. When P700 star gives off its electron, it now turns into a P700 plus. So very analogous to the kinds of events that happen in photosystem two. Very clear that photosystem two borrowed but twiddled with the basic approach of a photosystem one. Um, now we have a P700 plus. If that's where we left it, things would come to a grinding halt. So the electrons that are needed for P700 plus to be reduced will come from plastocyanin. Um, so rather than coming from water directly, these are coming from plastocyanin. You can see again uh, the overall intricate architecture, that they're well organized, well packed with each other. Here you can look down on top of it and see there's a radial symmetry to it all. Um, 
So where do those electrons that P700 star gives off? Where do the electrons go? Um, they go, first of all, to accessory chlorophylls. So you can see here's P700 down here. That's transferring electrons to accessory chlorophylls that are good at that. Uh, from those chlorophylls, they're going to be transferred to various quinones and iron sulfur centers. Oh, goody. This moved. I'm sorry. This box should have been pointing to the ferrodoxin. Anyway, the electrons um, can move and be transferred to ferrodoxin. And ferrodoxin is called that because it's an iron-containing protein that's involved in a lot of redox reactions. So it's ferro for iron, redoxin, redox protein. And the ferrodoxin is in the stroma, um, would be the matrix if it was mitochondrion. So you can see how this cycle can, can go around, um, that you have the unexcited P700 absorbs a photon, excited P700, the electron moves around through that chain of things to ferrodoxin. You have the oxidized P700 plus, have to reduce it to get back. Astocyanin can give its electrons. Now it's been oxidized, and we're back where we began with now a reduced molecule of ferrodoxin. So now the electrons are on ferrodoxin. Where are they going to go? Well, they can go a couple of places. Where the electrons on ferrodoxin go are, can be two major places uh, that will make a difference in the overall pattern and efficiency of photosynthesis. I'm going to start by talking about something called non-cyclic electron flow. And in non-cyclic electron flow, ferrodoxin can give up its electrons to NAD+. So you have uh, reduced ferrodoxin and the oxidized NADP+. The ferrodoxin gives up its electrons. Now you have NADPH, which is great for doing biosynthesis. And now the ferrodoxin is oxidized, and it can come back and pick up more electrons um, and uh, uh, keep going. You should notice that photosystem 1 doesn't pump protons. Okay? Photosystem 1 can move electrons. So by absorbing light energy, it can move electrons from plastocyanin to ferrodoxin to NADP plus pH. But it does not make any protons move. For non-cyclic electron flow to keep going, uh, we have to have some way for the plastocyanin to keep being regenerated. And that brings us to a slightly larger level of, of um, organization that sometimes is called the Z scheme, which is uh, the newest kind of photosynthesis. This is only around two and a half or three billion years old. This is the, what blue-grain algae do. It's how the oxygen got into the atmosphere. And it's worth taking a look at because it allows you to look at the whole thing at once. The scale over here is the um, electron motive force, how likely a molecule is to give up an electron or to snitch an electron. Down here, it really wants to steal electrons. It's a good oxidizing agent. Up here, it wants to give electrons, good reducing agent. So in photosystem one, when P600 is excited to become P680 star, it gives its electron to plastoquinone, and it's going to be re 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 uh, regenerated with electrons from water giving up oxygen. The electrons on plastoquinone are then transferred to cytochrome B6F. From there, they go to plastocyanin. And they're waiting around for when P700 is excited by light. It gets boosted up to P700 star. P700 star gives its electrons to ferrodoxin and then makes NADPH. And then plastocyanin can regenerate the P700 plus that's right about there. So it's called the Z scheme because you have two times when you bump things uphill into a more reducing state by absorbing light energy, and then they flow downhill just by the normal um, transfer of, of, of electrons uh, from more reducing to, to more oxidizing. Um, in this scheme, ultimately, electrons are coming from water, moving through all this way, and ending up on NAD pH. So in the Z scheme, you make oxygen, 
In the Z scheme, your electrons are coming from water, and both the photosystems are participating. You have an electron carrier of plastoquinone that's membrane-bound, like the ubiquinone. You have a water-soluble electron carrier, plastocyanin. You've got, electron, you've got protons pumped to this event, and at this event, uh, not over here. No protons are moved over there. Okay. Are people comfy with the, the non-cyclic electron flow? All right, so that's one way to do it. And it will produce NADP plus to NADPH net, um, and it will produce oxygen. The other way in which um, the electrons on ferrodoxin can be used is for something called cyclic electron flow. Now, that should imply that it's going to go around and around something, which it does. In cyclic electron flow, you have the electrons that are um, excited in photosystem one and transferred to ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin takes those electrons over to cytochrome B6F. The electrons there get transferred to plastocyanin, and plastocyanin takes it back to photosystem one to regenerate it. So in cyclic electron flow, photons at photosystem one energize the electrons, produce reduced ferrodoxin. Those electrons come back to cytochrome B6F, and they get transferred back to plastocyanin to go through the whole thing again. It is the cytochrome B6F that's going to be moving protons. It still has its association with plastoquinones, and there will be protons moved during the cycle because of cytochrome B6F. So all that this cyclic electron flow can do is turn um, energy absorbed by photosystem one into a proton gradient. There's no net accumulation of reducing power as NADPH. It's just going to produce a proton gradient. You can't use up the electrons because you have to keep reusing them again and again. Any questions? Yes. Billion, billion, yep. These are all very, very old. So this kind of cyclic electron flow is what things like uh, purple bacteria or green bacteria do well, that don't make oxygen. Um, and it's very, very old. And then some very bright ancestor of a blue-green alga came up with photosystem two. And that was probably around something like 3 billion or 3.25 billion years ago. Um, and they could make oxygen. So these, both of these systems are very, very old. They all predate e eukaryotes by billions of years. Okay. Now, one way that may be a little easier to see what's going on with the cyclic electron flow is to go back to the Z scheme. So you remember the Z scheme was when we had non-cyclic or linear electron flow. In cyclic electron flow, you have electron flow, you have the excitement of P700. The electrons go to ferrodoxin. From there, they backtrack down to cytochrome B6F, flow downhill again through plastocyanin, and just keep going like that. So the photosystem one acts as sort of a pump to re-energize the electrons. And cytochrome B6F is the location where all the, the proton pumping is going on. Okay. Are people comfy with that? Okay. So, let's move on. <clears throat> well, we've been alluding to the fact that um, the photo, photo events are um, moving protons, that photosystem 2 can move protons and cytochrome B6F can move protons. So we're building up a proton gradient. There's lots of protons building up in the lumen of the thylakoid. And there's a gradient from there across to the stroma. And what we're going to see is it's extremely similar to the way in which mitochondria make ATP. Um, there's a chloroplast ATP synthase. Um, it's got a membrane embedded component and uh, another component that is attached to it but projects into the, in this case, the stroma instead of the matrix. Um, Overall strategy is exactly the same. There's a CF0, meaning the part that spins around. So you can think of a zero as spinning around. So this is 
like the F0 that spins around in the mitochondria. And that has a spindle running up into the CF1 and poking each of the alpha beta dimers in turn to punch it into making some ATP. So the ATP happens in the CF1 part where when ADP and PI are bound to release ATP. And then the protons are flowing downhill from the lumen back into the stroma to, to fuel all of that. If we do the, the bookkeeping on this, um, eight photons uh, can pump four protons at photosystem two, eight protons at cytochrome B6F. And that would release one molecule of O2. It would take two water molecules to make one O2. Questions? Mm -hmm. So there are really a lot of similarities between the mitochondrion and the chloroplast. Um, the chief difference is chloroplast can capture light energy to drive all of this. Whereas mitochondria are just you know, using high energy electrons that they've gotten from fuels. Um, what are we going to do with the ATP and the NADPH that we've made? Up to this point, all that we've done is to make ATP from a proton gradient. And in the case of the non-cyclic electron flow, make some NADPH, those electrons that came from water. Somehow or other, we're going to have to fix carbon. Carbon fixation is whenever you take carbon dioxide, which is an inorganic carbon, and mash it in somehow or other to make an organic carbon molecule, or an organic molecule. Um, so this is where we're going to actually make useful sugars. Um, these reactions are sometimes called the dark reactions because they use the products of the light reactions. You must have light to make photosystem 1 and 2 work. You must have light for cytochrome B6F to work. And so you're only going to make ATP and you're only going to make NADPH when the lights are on. So ATP and NADPH are the products of light reactions. In principle, everything else from that point could go on in the dark. And that's why they're called the dark reactions. In, in point of fact, they do occur in the light. There's nothing bad about the light. It's just they're not, um, they don't themselves directly need light. What they need is ATP and NADPH. The, um, the magical step, for the most part, is going to be an, uh, an enzyme whose nickname is Rubisco, and you'll see why in a second, um, which can actually fix CO2. We've seen one or two other enzymes that can take carbon dioxide and fix it into a molecule. But they don't do that in a place where there's much net accumulation. They're, they just do it sort of as a temporary tag or high energy tag. What Rubisco does is actually make something that you can use long term. We're also going to look a little bit at another way in which carbon can be fixed called C4. Uh, living as we do here in Iowa, the C4 pathway is extremely important because corn plants are among the C4 plants. And their alternate way of doing these things is a very essential part of why they are able to do what they do and why Iowa has some of the economy it has. These initial products of carbon fixation are then going to be rearranged through a set of reactions called the Calvin cycle. Um, and we're going to see that the Calvin cycle has some resemblances to gluconeogenesis, some resemblances to the pentose phosphate pathway. And then once that has been done, you can use that for carbohydrate synthesis in general. And so who is or what is Rubisco? <coughs> Rubisco is the nickname for an enzyme that's called ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. And it's an absolutely honest name because it takes ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate and it adds a CO2 to it. So it's a carboxylase. So it's a perfectly reasonable name. It's just very long and it tends to get called Rubisco instead. It's a really, really, really amazing enzyme. 
Rubisco does something that is absolutely unparalleled by any other enzyme, and it makes life possible long term in terms of accumulating a lot of carbon fast. Before there was Rubisco, they must have fixed carbon somehow, but it was obviously not very efficient. So what goes on? How can Rubisco pull off a trick of adding a carbon dioxide without having to use any ATP, any GTP, or anything like that? How does Rubisco add a carbon dioxide for free? So this is what's going to happen. Rubisco can pull off a proton from the middle, you see it's on the three carbon, from the middle of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. Um, and it's quite possible that there's a magnesium there that helps to stabilize uh, the negative charge that's, that's set up there. Um, and there's then a rearrangement uh, from that form into the enolate form. So this is an ene diol. This would be an alcohol. If it was protonated, that would be an alcohol. So it would be an ene diol uh, is what we call that after the rearrangement. And you can see that this looks like something that wants to do something. The ene diolate structure is one that is not going to stay like that for very long. And uh, because of the structure of the ene diolate, carbon dioxide uh, can attack the carbon dioxide and scarf it on like that. So this carbon here is going to attack that carbon and make a new bond like that. And now we have a six carbon molecule. Okay. What next? So here is the six carbon molecule that we just made. And um, the next thing that Rubisco is going to catalyze is a very careful attack by water. It's not going to just um, uh, hydrolyze things. It's going to do something a little more interesting. Um, so you have here uh, the C3 again. This is the, the C3 counting from the end. It's currently a carbonyl carbon there. When the water attacks at that carbon, it converts it into this, where you have an alcohol on one side and um, the O- on the other. This doesn't look very comfy, does it? And it's not. And this molecule is going to spontaneously split into two molecules of phosphoglycerate. Um, and you can see here that they're identical molecules. They've just flipped them head to tail. Um, and one of those two molecules has on it the carbon dioxide, or the C and the two O's that came from the carbon dioxide. Um, and you remember resonance stabilization when we were talking about why ATP is such a great molecule? You can see that these things are resonance stabilized compared uh, to something like this, which is in a very strained form. Uh, in this molecule, you've got two negative charges in pretty close proximity to each other. Um, you've locked in uh, the location of the bonds, where for these two molecules, this is going to be resonance stabilized, that's resonance stabilized, and you don't have the constant contact between the, the negative charges. So splitting it from a six carbon fragment into two three carbon ones happens spontaneously. Um, there is more Rubisco than any other protein on Earth uh, because plants are more common than animals because we eat them. And because plants need a, have a lot of leaves, Rubisco is the most common one. Its three carbon fragments then are going to be the thing that drives anabolic metabolism in plants. It is not a very efficient enzyme. It's a brilliant enzyme, but it's not very efficient. It has a turnover of three per second. Now, I don't know if you remember some of those other numbers, but we were looking at other enzymes that could turn over a million times per second or a billion times per second. And Rubisco does it three times per second. And it's probably because it's doing such weird chemistry and has several intermediates along the way that it, it just can't hurry with what it's doing. Um, in land plants, we see it as a multimer like this, but Rubisco is not allosteric. We said before that in general, um, multimers could be allosteric and monomers weren't. Here's the exception in the other direction. 
Glucokinase was a monomer that was allosteric. Rubisco is a multimer that is not allosteric. And probably it's because it's such a bad enzyme in terms of efficiency that by making a multimer out of it, they can pack more into the chloroplast. And if you look at the pictures of chloroplasts, um, the, that stroma is one of the darkest things uh, in, in the cell. Uh, I think it might be worth popping back for a second to just look at that picture so where it is fast. Wakey, wakey. Come on. There we go. Okay. So if you remember back on these slides, um, I forgot. I can't think fast. Okay. Um, so the, the stroma of the chloroplast uh, tends to be a very dark part of the cell. This is not the most dramatic example of it we could have had. These are dark because those are membranes that have bound osmium tetroxide, so they're not, they're, they should not be compared directly to the other ones. I'm trying to decide. I don't think that's fast enough. Okay. Well, maybe that is a good place to break until tomorrow. So I'll see you then.